put their faith um, in who Christ is and what he has done. Acts 2, verse 41. Uh, Peter preaches and many become converted and they are baptized. And we are told in that particular verse that those who have been baptized are added into the church. So what we are seeing here again is um, they've had the message, they've repented, they've placed their faith in Christ, they are added to the church, but quite importantly, those who are inside the church are expected to live like Christians, right? Um, this new covenant community marked out by the lines of baptism um, have an expectation that those who receive that sign become baptized, have actually believed in Jesus. And when you look at instructions about um, um, church discipline taught by Christ himself in Matthew 18, it is expected that those who are within are actually living like Christians. There should be something distinguishing those who are within from those who are without, right? And those boundary markers become all important again because they are defining who God's people are and the glory of God is at stake is at stake. Being loose, playing fast and loose with those boundary lines, right, who we grant that sign of baptism to, right, is also playing fast and loose with God's glory in the church itself. So Matthew 18, 15 to 20, instructions being given that those who are inside um, the church ought to be expected to walk in his ways. And if they persist in unrepentance, namely acting as those who are outside the boundary markers of God's people, then the church is supposed to gather and actually put them outside those boundary lines. God cares about those lines. God cares about the conduct of the people who are within those lines and those who are without, without those lines, outside of those lines. So baptism clearly here being spoken of as an, 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 an initiating sign, right? Make disciples baptizing them, right? Those who um, proclaim faith in Christ, ought to receive um, this very sign, which is the pattern that you're seeing in the book of Acts and then um, all the implications that follow therein. The Lord's Supper as well, right? The Lord's Supper is going to act um, as another boundary marker to, to some extent. So the initiating sign here being baptism, right? You, you enter into um, the covenant community, at least physically, um, through that sign. But then those who are inside it, they gather regularly, right, to break the bread and participate in the cup, um, and thus displaying that they are the people of God on earth. So here these verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 18, um, important verses in this, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 18, Paul addressing in this particular case um, the problem of food being offered to idols and Christians participating in, um, in those feasts, and Paul's basically going to make the point of, it's not nothing, guys, it's not nothing to go and join yourself with those who are feasting um, on food offered to idols is, is not nothing. And he's going to connect, make an allusion between those feasts that they are participating in, in the temple, because people are saying, they're nothing. We know that there's, there's no real gods there, right? Um, but he's going to connect that feast to another feast, um, namely the Lord's um, Supper. But what he says about um, that sacrament, the Lord's Supper, is important in us understanding the boundary markers around God's people. So he says, it's the cup of blessing, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 18, the cup of blessing that we give thanks for. Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? So again, quite importantly, those who are drawing nigh to the Lord's Supper, they are claiming a participation in Christ's work, right? It's not unbelievers who are drawing nigh um, to the Lord's Supper. It's those who are claiming he died for me. Because that's exactly what Jesus says. This is my body broken for you. There are some amazing statements, right, for, um, for us to ponder um, as, as, as Christ is um, preparing to go and die on the cross. Verse 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for all of us share that one bread. Look at the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in what is offered on the altar? How then is the body of Christ made? This is how the body of Christ is made visible. So when you're asking the question, on earth, how do we see God's people? 
Where do we find them? Where do we find them? They are going to be displayed by the places where the sacraments, right, the ordinances, are practiced. Those who are baptized are saying, we were living in the world, living in sin, but now we have become believers, we have died with Christ, and we have been raised in newness of life. We are Christians now. Those Christians continue to gather around the Lord's Supper. And when they are gathering around the Lord's Supper, breaking that bread and participating in that cup, the body of Christ, the local body of Christ, is being put on display, is being revealed. Those lines are different from the Old Testament lines, right? So you're not speaking about the lines of inside Eden, outside Eden, inside the ark, outside the ark, inside the promised land, outside the promised land. You're in many ways speaking about inside the church and outside the church, and those lines are being drawn using the sacraments. What we are going to see then as Baptists here is that where other denominations will argue that those people within those lines are a mixed people, like the one in the Old Testament, we are seeing clearly from the very great commission, the pattern in the book of Acts, that the people within those boundary markers are a regenerate people. These boundary markers are connected to congregationalism, the way authority is going to be practiced in that very congregation. So notice this, Matthew 16. Maybe let's go there. Um, Matthew 16 and verse, 30, verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. So we all are familiar with this portion. Christ is saying that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail um, against it. So he asks that important question, who do people say that I am? Critical statement made, you are the Christ in verse 16, verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then in verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So I will build my church, and I will give the keys to the kingdom. Not a very clear passage, right? Like, we are not going to start preaching, let's go bind the devil and loose the devil, right? We can take a passage like this, I'm going to use it for, um, um, for anything that we please, not happening in this very room. Um, we're all going to characterize um, everybody else, right? Um, chapter 18, um, a couple of chapters later, so Christ's first mention of the church is chapter 16. Chapter 18, a couple of chapters um, later, he brings up the name church, the word church again. And as he's doing so, he's speaking um, about how uh, one ought to deal with, handle um, the issue of one who is professing to be a Christian and yet is walking in an repentance. So verse 15, right? Um, if a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, right? Uh, if he doesn't listen, you're taking another brother. Verse 16, if he doesn't listen, take two um, along with you. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, um, you're supposed to go and tell it to the church. Like how this phrase goes afterwards. It says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, Right? Even to the church, let him be to you as a gentile and a tax collector. So when you have individuals within the church walking in unrepentance, church, don't take that casually. These are God's people. These are the distinguished, set apart people of God through whom he is demonstrating, displaying his glory. Plead with him, ask him to turn and repent, and if he persists, in walking in unrepentance, who has the mandate, the final authority to actually act? The church. It seems like the buck stops with the church. And quite importantly, the task that the church is fulfilling here is that of defining, or at least distinguishing, guarding the boundary markers, who is in and who is out. Someone is in and they're walking in unrepentance, Talk to him, take two people, talk to him. If he refuses, bring it to the church, the congregation. 
if he doesn't listen even to the church. It's the congregation that are mandated to in many ways reverse the sign that they gave to him of saying we are identifying you as a follower of Christ, so we're going to baptize you and say that your conduct is, is contrary to your testimony. We as a congregation are forced now to put you outside um, of those boundary markers. Quite importantly in this section, there is actual true authority um, that is given to them. The phrase is used again in verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on us shall be bound in heaven, loose on us shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So this passage, not a uh, right, um, reference point to uh, when we meet at a cafeteria, as three Christians, um, and say, you know, where two or three are gathered, um, there I am amongst them, but rather the church, when it is gathered formally to function as God has called them to function in defining those boundary lines, Christ promises that his power, this is legitimate authority that I am granting to the congregation, right? Um, and, and in many ways, when you look even at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm speaking about in the eschatological community, right? Um, it's going to be ruling together with Christ, right? Do you not know that, that, that you are going to judge angels? And so in many ways as a church, now, 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 now this priesthood of all believers, spirit-filled, in many ways already starting to, to, to image and mirror that which is going to be on that day as they fulfill a very critical function of passing judgment, if you so please. It's like a mini judgment that's a foreshadowing of the grand judgment on that very day as they look at someone and say, your life is inconsistent with your testimony. We have to put you out um, of the congregation. In chapter five of First Corinthians, let's go there as well. Um, Paul is going to use the same phrase again. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, allow me to just start reading here and verse 4. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4.